Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and I want since we're going into the next year and 2024, which I believe is, you, know what, you can call it the year, whatever you want to do, but I've been here a long time. I've been here since 2013 in this crypto thing, and I've been through a lot of ups and downs. You know, right now you, you see a lot of people talking about, oh, XRP is not moving or whatever. Well, guess what? I've been here since 2013 holding. I've been through long, many long periods of nothing happening. I've, I've been through periods where nothing could touch XRP in performance. But the one thing I've learned more than anything is I can spot manipulation going on. That's what makes me more nervous than anything. I can spot it a mile away. I saw what they did with Bitcoin and Ethereum the last five years. I studied, I knew exactly what they were doing. I'm seeing the same thing going on with this Solana right now, and I'm going to show it to you. But first, I want you to listen to some good advice from Ralph Paul. And if you need to feed your inner degen, 80% in stuff like that, and 20% or 10% in the stuff you want to punt. So you can feed your inner degen, but you don't screw up the whole trade. Again, don't fuck this up. It's the key mantra for this market. Don't overtrade, don't use leverage, don't FOMO following your friends. Look, that's, the, oh, that's so important. The... I see Solana, I don't care what, if, let's say it's pumped 50% the last uh, few days. Well, first of all, I know in my gut that it's being manipulated by the big the big people. And there's a game, they're trying to re revive, they've said they want to revive FTX. Well, the holdings of FTX, Solana is huge. I'll show you something on that in a minute. I'm just saying, be careful out there, folks, because the big boys are playing a game here and they're going to exit if they haven't already. A trade you missed out. Just stick with the program. Hold your trade. Add on sell-offs. Anything over twenty percent, add into it, and just calmly let it play out. Don't overtrade. Don't. I've been calmly letting it play out since two thousand thirteen, and so many things never made any sense. What's always made sense to me is XRP and XLM. The rest of this stuff comes and goes, and all that. I'm playing the long game. Have been playing the long game. Will continue to play the long game. I've never been able to get my mind off what these things represent, how they work, how they, how uh, the people around it, the transparency when nothing else is, the non-shadiness when everything else is. Big tops, buy in, buy out, you'll miss it. I've seen everybody do it. I've done it myself. Just stick with the program. Keep your cool head. Hold it. Store it on your ledger. Don't let your exchange blow up and take it away from you. Don't do bloody DeFi farming because something else can take your coins away. Your job is to not part with your coins until 2025, particularly towards the end of 2020. That's, I mean, he just nailed it. So here you've got you've got the Solana thing. You got 57% in, in seven days. And look, I'm not saying... Uh, look, I'm, if you held Solana, great. I'm, I'm all for. It. I'm just saying, the long game is the is the game here. This short, this pumping and dumping. So look, so Laura Shin, of course, was what made sure she put a big old graphic out about Solana's 600% pump. I want to remind everybody, this is what went on during um, ETH. Get John Deaton did a long thread one time on how ETH became the only game in town. And it, you know, you know the story. Look who just happened to be sitting beside the uh, consensus attorneys while they were Standards saying this. Ethereum technology used in enterprise. And we thought, why don't we do this with best, best practices and token sales again? So we started a little bit on this with the Coinbase framework uh, last year. And the, the idea of the Brooklyn project is um, getting to a place where token sales better protect consumers. So Vinny talked about a couple of things, right? Like transparency in pre-sales. That's a big thing, right? Like what happened to the token foundry, by the way? But anyway, this guy was one of the attorneys for consensus. Now, you're watching all this Solana stuff. So let me give you a little reminder, folks. It didn't make any sense when they were talking about, oh, we need to resurrect FTX. You got a Wall Street guy that's come in and, and I think there's a Wall Street guy that's behind revamping FTX, like a New York Stock Exchange guy. 
And then this is Sam Bankman Freed. What was the coin that he was pumping? What was the coin that they held so much of? The underrated token right now. Most underrated token right now. Um, okay, I'm going to give it non investment advice, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was the same freaking characters that, that, that pumped the Bitcoin Ethereum narrative for the last five years. The same characters popped up out of no way, out of nowhere, backing this FTX, acting like this is the greatest thing and the biggest thing since sliced bread. I had never even heard of it. I had heard of Coinbase since the, I got in this game. I had never heard of FTX. And then overnight, they've got Tom Brady out there doing commercials and they're acting like this is the greatest platform there is. I smell a rat then, I smell it to this day, and now I smell it with Solana. At least as of a month ago, I think the answer in some sense was Solana, not sorry, but basically just because I think it had like a lot of bad PR over a short period of time. I think it sort of deserved that to be clear. Like it went like technologically it had a lot of shit to work through. But I think it has sort of already worked through like two thirds of that. I think it will get through the other third. And I think that like the thing that people were missing about it was that anytime you test the limits of what's possible, that's when you figure out what breaks. Any blockchain would have broken if it tried to do what Solana had done. And this was a way for it to figure out what needed to be refined and what needed to be improved. Um, so I, I think it's sort of like, you know, I, I would have wished that sort of like it had been, the validator, you know, uh, issues had been resolved earlier. Like that would have been much better. FTX and Alameda are going through bankruptcy and still hold eight to 10% of the total Solana supply. Will they be forced to sell it? And how seriously could this affect Sol's ability to fly in the next bull run? But this is the amount that they have today from the numbers that I have. And according to a report from the Block Pro, Alameda Research still holds 6.1%. That's FTX and Alameda of the total supply as of Feb 2023. They've been unloading. So December uh, 2021, they had 9%. Feb 2022, they had 7%. Now they only have 6%. And that doesn't represent a lot of the daily volume. I do believe the market could consume it as well. So again, sell pressure. Um, you know, there was a lot of sell pressure. A lot of crap went down with that particular chain. Folk, make, make no mistake. The whole Solana pump that's going on right now has everything to do with the FTX bankruptcy and trying to make some of these these institutional guys whole. Write it down. Now, we, li we now live in a world, our, our world is lies versus truth, transparency versus disguised whales and hidden Satoshis, truth versus lies, good versus evil. That's the world we now live in. I've been in this long enough to see, I can see around corners. I can see the good around corners, the evil, the lies, the manipulation. I can see it, smell it. That's what happens when you make two videos a day on crypto and XRP and Ripple and all this stuff. I'm just telling you everybody to be careful. You know what I feel really good about? I feel really good about just making sure my XRP is safe and focusing on that right now. That's what I'm focused on. That and, and accumulating anything that I think is still undervalued. That's what I'm doing. Zero Hedge put out this article yesterday. The control system is collapsing. The great taking looms as globalism's, as globalism's last gasp. Now, this article is based on a video. There's a video documentary that was put out on November 29th. I watched the whole thing last night. It is great. It's called The Great Taking. Just go to YouTube and type in The Great Taking. It tells you all about what's happened, what's been happening in our economy and our world over the last 50 years, okay? It'll give you a great understanding of where we are and what you need to be, how you need to be thinking about your money and how you need to be thinking about what to do to protect yourself and your family. Go watch it. This guy, this is great right here. Reporter asked him, uh, if you were to remove the Federal Reserve, what would you replace it with? For a TV, the world is thinking. Lots of questioners want to know whether you share Congressman Ron Paul's skepticism of the Fed. And now I'm going to quote you. This isn't in basic economics, but a recent column. Quote, for most of the history of this country, there was no Federal Reserve System. 
there you go, that dirty trick of bringing in history. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, there was no Federal Reserve System, which was established in 1914 to prevent bank failures. But bank failures in the 1930s exceeded anything ever seen before the Fed was established. Close quote. If you could, if we could make you dictator, would you abolish the Fed? Yes. You would. Yes, I mean, for, for, for the reasons I just gave, the history. There's no, uh, you know, the Fed represented wonderful hopes, but, but we've had so many programs that represented wonderful hopes that ended in disaster. I, I don't doubt that someone who is sufficiently uh, scholarly could come up with examples of where the Federal Reserve made things better. But the question is, overall, what was it supposed to do? It was supposed to do not only prevent bank failures, it was supposed to prevent huge changes in the uh, money supply, in particular, uh, great deflations. Right. The greatest deflation in American history occurred under the Federal Reserve System. You know, we, we, there was a crisis in 1907. Uh, J.P. Morgan, the original J.P. Morgan, uh, called the other banks into a room, uh, supposedly locked the doors, and said, we've got to do something or we're going to all collapse. And they did something and they didn't all collapse. But, but, the, but pe the progressives were, were shocked that one man could come in and take command of the situation, and especially someone who wasn't even in the government. Right. So, but t so what would you do? You'd move us back to the gold standard, or you'd let no, no. banks issue their own currencies the way they did uh, uh, up through the Civil War? Say you, you could, I could, I could. Well, like, they weren't doing any of those things no. uh, as the time the Federal Reserve was was created. We were on the gold standard, though. But. Uh, it, it, whether we're on or off the gold standard, there's a, that's another whole set of arguments. There's no evidence that I can see that over this vast period of time that the Federal Reserve has existed, that things on the whole have been better. The great post-World War II uh, uh, inflation was fed by the, Fed, by the Federal Reserve doing exactly what they're planning to do now, namely buying up the bonds issued by the Treasury. Oh, but don't you have, I have to say, I wasn't expecting your answer to, uh, to run in this direction, so I don't have questions, follow-up <laughs> questions prepared, or you may actually have, I may actually have to think here in real time. But don't we have the example of that period from 83 through a uh, couple of years ago, that 25 years of economic expansion, we had only two downturns. They were both very shallow and very brief, and what you had was Paul Volcker, whom Carter appointed, but Reagan gave the freedom actually to ring inflation out of the currency. He did that by the mid-80s. The economy takes off. Alan Greenspan does a reasonably good job, and then at the end, there's too much money in the, but maybe five years of getting it wrong. So you What got, Volcker did was undo the harm that previous Federal Reserves had <laughs> done. Including Arthur Burns. Yeah, unfortunately, who was my right. teacher and one of my much admired. Right. Right. So, but what would you replace it with? How would the currency? Who who would? How would Gold. the currency run? We we, we we would replace it. We could replace it with what, what existed when it was created, which was the gold gold standard. Well, it, maybe the gold standard, but maybe not. But I, but there's no evidence that I, these. What well, would you replace it? Things always bother me. You know, oh, I, they do? when someone removes the cancer, what do you replace it with? <laughs> <laughs> great. That's a, that's a great great point. Now here's Tucker, Tucker Carlson uh, on Bitcoin. Listen to this. This is interesting too. And the promise of Bitcoin, of course, I mean, as a non-Bitcoin expert, I'll just tell you my, my view of it because I think it's true. The promise of Bitcoin is I'm just getting rich from Bitcoin. The promise of Bitcoin is you're independent of control by the people who devalue the currency since Rome. They do it in every, every single currency is devalued because no politician over time can resist the temptation to print more money because it makes them more powerful. So that's just like a, that's something that never ends. They always debase the currency, even digital currency. And they want to move to such big digital currencies. They get complete control of you. If you disagree with them, you can't eat. And Bitcoin offers really the, a way out of that. And that's totally indefensible. There's no way any, Jenny Yellen, who really is a very dark figure, is never going to stand up and be like, I'm against Bitcoin because it would disempower me and allow the average person to have a little bit more control over his own life. Never going to say that. She's going to be like, terrorists use Bitcoin. Really, terrorists. By the way, any terror group she names has absolutely, without question, received funding from the U.S. State Department at some time. Or other. Yeah, how about the airdrop of money under Obama to uh, Iran? Billions of dollars on pallets. Think any, any of that was used for terrorist funding? Just say. Um, which is another way of saying, you have no moral standing to lecture me about anything. You are my servant. Please be quiet as I go about my life. That is the right posture. And I, I 
realize they shut down your bank account. She tells you everything about how you're on the right track. Okay. Then we have this. Look at this. Private banker asked me for some Bitcoin price scenarios. Here's some back of the envelope calculations using 2023 numbers. BTC matches gold market cap, 710,000 Bitcoin. 5% of all wealth is parked in Bitcoin, 1.1 million. Upper bound price, 11.5 million. Half of all wealth is in Bitcoin. Well, the only way that happens is with a complete collapse of the monetary system. Um, so check this out. This is from Blockstars. This is a clip of Chris Larson. I've never heard this one before. I have to say the, the, the most delightful memory I have was, uh, you remember when Marketa, yeah, Marketa did, is this credit card company, and they did a credit card that allowed you to load XRP on it, right? So I don't know when this was. This is maybe 20, uh, tw uh, 2014 or something, maybe. And I just remember loading XRP onto this card going to the gas station and filling up my car with XRP. And that was like the coolest experience, you know, ever. All right, neat. Okay, John Deaton says, uh, this. Tom Emmer had tweeted this, Americans gave our House of Republican majority a mandate to hold the Biden administrative accountable and we're delivering. John Deaton makes a great point. I assume we will see a subpoena being issued by Patrick McHenry from the Financial Committee Respectfully, strong worded letters containing empty threats of subpoena does not constitute oversight. Now, folks, I'm going to go further into this in the member group. That would be at DAIXRP.com. We're going to go a little further down the dark hole of Congress and what's really going on and what they're doing, what they're not doing, and more importantly, why are they not doing it? I think I know exactly why they're not doing anything. I think I know exactly the reason that many of these, many of the, the con men, and con men and women in Congress give lip service to things. They talk about, oh, Gary, Gary Gensler, if you, um, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, we're going to send you a subpoena. I don't want to have to do it. Then they never do it. Then they announce their retirement, Patrick McHenry, but they never do anything. They just talk about what they're going to do. I think that we have a really bad, like I said earlier in this video, I think we're in a good versus evil situation. I think it's time to take out the trash or not have a country anymore. I'm going to go into a lot of that stuff um, in the group. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends and family that also in DAIXRP.com today, we're going to have a uh you know that uh dr evil we're gonna have a dr evil christmas message in the group as well <laughs> and it's great